Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program is brought to you by Physical Culture Collective. For more information, visit their website at physicalculturecollective.com. I'm Erica Wides, host of Let's Get Real, the cooking show about finding, preparing, and eating food. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. This is Cynthia Cherish Malloran, Reverend DJ Cherish the Love, and you are listening to Primary Food on Heritage Radio Network. So before I forget, let me tell you how to reach out to me and get my attention on social media, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at DJ Cherish the Love, and love is spelled L-U-V, and hashtag using Primary Food or Heritage underscore Radio or hashtag rev love. So welcome to the 21st episode. Wow, I'm almost done with the second season of Primary Food. That's a lot of episodes of me talking about things that nourish me and you, us. And what exactly is primary food? So I learned this really great concept in nutrition school at IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, that the food you eat, you know, the stuff we put in our mouths, and chew and enjoy, we consider that to be secondary food. Primary food is everything else in life that nourishes us before we sit down and eat. And that's stuff like enjoying music, reading a great book, hanging out with your friends, walking your dog and taking your time, cooking food, having a great job, creative expression, playing games, exercise, all that good stuff. And I'm so glad that I learned this concept because it was the high quality primary food that I kept in my life while going through chemotherapy last year that kept me happy and healing my cancer. So if you're listening, you can call in live at 718-497-2128. I'm going to repeat that again because I'm sure you didn't have a pencil in your hands. 718-497-2128. Any questions and comments, please do call. So I'm continuing the topic of music as nutrition, and today I have another musical guest. Maybe we need a little intro music. <clears throat> How about you? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Sitting next to me is Isaac Raz. Hi. Composer, musician, singer, president, and founder of Whole Music, LLC in New York. That's right. So music... Isaac, is not a hobby. No. It's a form of nutrition. You and I have talked about this. I'd yeah. love to hear and share with everyone your idea and your thoughts about the importance of music and nourishment in our lives. Well, you know, uh, it seems to me that, um, and, it, and it's been known basically forever, that, that we humans, you know, probably the first thing we did was not to 
stones together and <laughs> and then repeated it a couple of times and it was like yeah that sounds good do some more of that it it seems like music is just ingrained in in our our very existence um and so it's it's essential it's as essential as food nutrition and and the concept of the primary food is is brilliant because it, it's true you 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 are who you are first and then you have to feed that that organism with calories but but you still are what you are and music is part of what you are it's part of your your the baseline where we start from i can say that for sure if i have not enough music in my life i feel starved absolutely yeah so that says a lot about it being nourishing. I, I, you probably, you know, while we were sitting here chit-chatting before the show, I couldn't stop playing the keyboard. Yeah. And, and, it, and it, was, it was partly to calm my nerves, and it was partly to just warm up and figure out what I wanted to do. But this is, this is a theme, you know. I, I, just can't, I just can't stop doing it. It's just, if I do, it doesn't feel right. Unless I'm tired and I need to rest, you know, we all do. But, you know, it's that, it's that constant urge to do it. So music for you is equally as important as really good secondary food, like a yeah. good dinner. What is Absolutely. the musical equivalent of a really great dinner? Well, something that... that it's, the parallels are amazing now that I'm just thinking about it. What's great food? It's simple, high-quality, fresh ingredients, simply prepared. You don't do too much to it, right? You don't overcook it. Handmade. Handmade. Yeah. And and the and the key being simple, right? At the very at the very core of all the best food is simplicity. Mm. And mm. I think the same is true for music. You know, even the most sophisticated um, and and sort of complex sounding music, really at its core, is based on really simple principles, and they're embellished a certain way. And it's and it's that that simplicity in the pattern that just grabs us and makes us really, you know, say, "What was that?" And we want more of it. As you're saying that, I think I'm making the connection as to why music is as nourishing as eating a meal. It's because it taps into our senses, yes. just as a meal would. Oh yeah, your sight, your taste. That's right. You yeah. know, when you're cooking, what you know, um, you're 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 multitasking. You're smelling what's what's coming on you and you can tell by the smell if it's done or not and you can tell what you want to add to it and you can and there's also the tactile you're 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 touching the the food you're trying to see how done it is you're Mm -hmm. you're you're, uh there's taste there's also memories and feelings you know i used to remember when my you know grandmother used to make these vegetable patties blah 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 you know (laughs) And and I'm I can't get it you know it, I can't get her rest you know this is uh-huh, all these uh-huh. different multi layered things happening simultaneously that's exactly the case when you're playing an instrument or singing a song you're you've got the content of the song you're you've got the technique of it because of course also in cooking you know there's technique you got to chop things you got to saute things right, right. You, um, in in music there's a certain way of doing a certain scale there's a certain way of doing an, uh, um, and then hopefully you get that so ingrained that you don't have to think about it anymore. Anymore. And so now you're thinking about higher level things like, you know, this this chord sounds purple. You know, I don't <laughs> I don't know why it sounds purple, but maybe to somebody else it sounds, you know, I don't know, beige. But <laughs> that's it. We all experience our own experience with it, you know, and, and it does. It connects all these different senses. Just like our, food. Just like food. Just like food. And as I think about food and music being so different yet kind of the same, you know, I think about how both. Involve instruments. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Both are all about timing. Right? Oh, yeah, timing. That's, I, I mean, mean, that's the most important. I mean, ask me, what's the most important? Okay, Never I'm going to ask you. What's the most important thing about music? <laughs> timing. <laughs> <laughs> and the same with prepping food. I mean, you yeah. can have the same ingredients, cook it too long, too short. Yeah, it's not going to be the same thing, you know. That's right, and it tr- it transforms. It, it, so every level you can think of, practically, there are so many parallels. Um, and actually, when I when I teach, um, or when I uh, when I have um, I have a studio that I help songwriters realize their their you know their songs into actual recordings. Many of them aren't really trained musicians; they just have really great ideas. 
and they don't know what to do with them. And and part of part of my job in that case is to um, sort of try to get inside their head and see what their what their intention was. And um, and so it's it's about. Oh, and we were talking about time. Remind me what we were talking about because I lost Timing. my train of thought. <laughs> Timing. Um, uh, uh, t- and 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 the different associations, right? And so I'm so I'm trying to to help them realize um, c- communicating. No, it was something else. It was something. We'll come back to it. Yeah, we'll come back. We'll to come it. back to it. <laughs> but but it, it really does. Um, oh, teaching. That's right. Explaining to it. So I explain to it. I explain things to my clients and to my students in terms of food. In terms of cooking, for example, putting together a great track is like putting together a great meal. You have to balance many different elements. I'm so glad I remember this. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're putting together some, you know, all these different elements, and you have to balance them very carefully. And and there are there's no one right way of doing it, too. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's some play in there, and um and then when when they hear this, they they sort of become a little bit less sort of, you know, uh, fearful of the unknown, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and then they get into it because it's something that obviously we all we all eat. So now you know, okay, so this process of putting it together, it's really the same thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I bet in the method that you teach your music students and whatever terminology you use, I bet that can be overlaid onto a culinary teacher. Yeah. I'm sure of it because as you were speaking, it sounded like, well, you could be saying this in the kitchen too. To cooking students as well. Yeah. It's so funny how 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 similar it is, um, and I guess I guess we're 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 going to be talking also about about movement and and, and other things. We're going to be talking about a too. lot of stuff. So so <laughs> and that all all has to it all it all falls right into the same category. So this conversation of food pairing and music. So we'll talk about well, what, what's your secondary food like? How do you how do you eat? And how do you enjoy your well, um, I've uh, I've recently gone on a complete completely plant based diet, so I guess I guess I'm a vegan, um, uh, even though uh, I'm still kind of wrestling with the with my own self identity because I was like the biggest meat eater, <laughs> and now all of a sudden it's like you know I don't want to do that anymore, but now I have to sort of re you know revamp my life around it and. And it's been great. I mean, I've been, had so much energy, and and but I also have had to make certain modifications in how I, I prepare my food. Um, and if you are anywhere outside of the East Village, or Bushwick, or you know, you're on your own. Hmm. If you're on pla- unless unless you just want to like survive on French fries, you know, which is probably no. not the best thing. Um, I mean, it's it tastes yummy. <laughs> All you French fries <laughs> fans, I'm I'm with you, but you can't survive on that alone. So you have to be real disciplined and take your own food and and get it get it done. And and um, another thing about it is I found a lot of diversity in in. Or I'm trying to find a lot of diversity in what I make, which is a challenge because I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I would go to the Chinese restaurant and order the same thing. Like they'd know me. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. you're the mm-hmm. general Tso's chicken and the, yeah, I know you. Yeah, okay. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> or now it's general Tso's tofu, you know? But, but it's the, but it's the same. Uh, it's that I, I want the comfort in the familiar. And so there's this, there's this push and pull between, um, I want to find all these new possibilities that I that I that I should have because obviously variety and and um, and diversity in your diet is actually a good thing. It's healthy, different kinds of grains and vegetables and all that. Pairing that, I mean, uh, uh, balancing that with my desire to just have the same thing, you mm-hmm, know, you mm-hmm. know what I want. So it's an interesting. It's been an interesting journey of Would late. You feel better. Oh, I feel a what, million. What prompted times you better. to change the way? You eat was it health reasons or well it was a combination of factors you know um i don't know what what eventually tipped the balance for me um maybe it was um i i remember when it happened i remember mm-hmm. i was i was actually 
eating a huge oh. steak. Oh, <laughs> and, that steak must have been bad. And it was no, it was <laughs> great, and it was and I and I made it, and it was perfect. I mean, you made it. It was perfect, wow. and and but then I was like, I started to really think about it, and I was like, you know what? I just it stopped being appealing, even though it was very tasty. It stopped being appealing for a lot of different reasons. What were you picturing in that moment? Well, the whole, just everything surrounding it. Uh, never mind the death of the animal. Okay, there's of course there's that, but there's the abuse that happens in the um, uh, in the industrialized from the industrialized farming. They they don't only abuse the animals; they abuse the people that work for them. They abuse the political system. They abuse the environment. Um, and, and it just got to a point where I said, I just don't want to be a part of this anymore. And yes, it does involve a personal sacrifice, but now, you know, I go up to, I teach a lot in Westchester County and there's a, a really cute little petting zoo up there called Muscoot Farm, you know, and they got <laughs> little cows and little sheep. And I look at the cow and I say, Hey, we're cool. All right. <laughs> and you know, I really never, it never dawned on me how, much significance that actually does have, you know? And how old were you when you had this mind shift? 47. I, I regret to say that I'm now 48, but <laughs> that was... Yeah. Now 48. Almost, going, almost coming on a year now. It's August will be a year. And what, what, are the, what are the big changes in your energy? And Oh my gosh. I just, I have it <laughs> for one. <laughs> And your creativity? Has it affected your creativity? It's affected every level of my life in a positive way. That's not to say that I don't struggle with it. That's not to say that I don't sometimes, especially, you know, when, when, when we're out, uh, you know, my girlfriend and I were like, uh, they're barbecuing, they're, they're you know, and, and, and we're subsisting on whatever we're allowed to have within that narrow bandwidth when you go, when you go out. And then I, you know, my inner child starts to throw a, tr a temper tantrum, but then I eat something and I feel better and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm still happy I'm doing this. <laughs> and so now you're preparing food at home that's more plant-based. It's 100% plant-based. 100%. I have, I have no animal products in my diet that I know of. Do you, do you listen to music when you prep your food and when you eat food at home? Being so musical. You know, that's a really good question. I used to, but now I just, I don't. I actually, I had to do it in my head. Oh, it's in your head. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm humming or I'm going over something. And I would actually, what happens, this is, it's interesting you should bring this up because, you know, I live in a, um, you know, studio apartment in New York City and it's, it's not very large. And, uh, and so the kitchen is, is over here and the piano is over there. Uh -huh. And I can't tell you how many things I have burned because <laughs> I put them on and then I was like, okay, let's go. And, you know, no, maybe it was. Dun, 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 dun. And the next thing you know, that sense of smell comes in and says, you're burning something. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, you know, my pasta has become porridge. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, this is not al dente anymore. <laughs> so have you put your piano out of the kitchen room? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's right there. You can't escape it. And I have this little keyboard on the next, uh, on the next corner. And then I have a little, little tiny keyboard next to my computer on the dining table. And it's just, it's, uh, you can't escape it. I, you know, I, I, I like what you said that the music has been in your head and, and I guess I re I, I'm realizing now that's kind of what I had been doing, but over the past couple of days I did a test mm -hmm. in preparation for this episode. Okay. I mean, it's, so it's summer now, right? And in the summer, I basically start my day with a salad. I know it's really super counter breakfast picture, you know, cause I grew up with right. pancakes right. and right. But interestingly, you know, other cultures that, you know, my, my parents come from Israel, salad's part of breakfast over there. What kind of salad? It's just uh, Israeli salad. It's, it's tomatoes and cucumbers and maybe for onions for yeah. breakfast. Onions for breakfast. Yeah. yeah cool. Right. So yeah. I was thinking like, you know, this is not too strange then. Thanks for telling me that. Yeah. <laughs> I do this salad in the morning and it's a big salad, like a huge bowl. And that's basically, I tell myself, that's like my salad for the day. And, and that could be a whole thing of romaine, you know, like a big thing of it. So, you know, like, what do I put in it? Um, I'll put an apple in it. Sometimes I'll put a nectarine in it. I'll throw some beans in it. Um, maybe a little bit of onion. Wait, I got to write this down. Yeah, write it down. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I start my day with that. And 
it, it was in the beginning, like, you know, a few years ago when I was shifting what, quote, breakfast looked like, that was really challenging. Right, yeah. Super challenging because I felt like I was abandoning something instead mm. of gaining something. So eventually that shifted and I'm very okay with it because I can't do the pancake. I mean, I don't, you know, do the egg or right. um, bacon thing, but... That I realized over the years how draining that was for my energy. It's amazing. Yeah. Even last year, uh, I, you know, I would like, quote unquote, treat myself. This is back when I would do that. And my friend would be, ah, let's go grab brunch. And like, All right. And I would get the, the, the hungry hunter lumberjack, <laughs> you know. The in, beast man the breakfast. Beast man, <laughs> beast man brunch. You know, it's a stack. Of, and, then, and, then I would, and then I would ask for all the butter they have. And I would I would wang like butter between <laughs> each one on both sides because who wants a dry pan? You want a, you want that <laughs> butter in there, and then and then yeah, oh boy. And then about an hour and a half later, that's my day. I'm done. I'm like, I have to sleep it off for about you know 18 hours. Yeah, but you're not done. You do eat later on top of that, right? I mean, yeah, if I can move. <laughs> But I, I, I said to myself, I, I'm never going to do this on a day where I actually have to do something. Exactly. Because you shut down, you know, yeah. completely shut down. Now, do you remember a place in the East Village, I think it was, called Royal Canadian Pancake House? No. Okay. So this place, and it, it's closed down maybe 15 years by mm -hmm. now. They used to serve a stack of pancakes that, no joke, was at least the size of my head. And people would order that left and right. Yeah. You know, I can't say that everyone would, you know, actually finish it, but there were people who finished it. Yeah. Now, that was what that kind of porn <laughs> was like it's, what I grew up with. It, I, I can't. My body suffered you, so much. You might it. as well just like inject, I don't know. Pancake syrup in, into, your, into your veins. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, so life 2.0, actually, by now it's like life 3.0. So I start my day with this big salad yeah. and, and I make a big one because. You know, I am an overeater. I love to indulge in what I'm eating. So I figure, well, hey, um, how bad could it be if I'm eating too much of a salad, right? So I start my day basically with a huge pillow of roughage in my gut, right? And I feel really good about that. Um, yeah, and it stays with you. And you have a lot of it, and it gives you energy. And I dump olive oil on it and everything. Yeah. And I tell myself, okay, you had that. And you could eat, quote, whatever you want for the rest of the day, end quote. And I end up not eating much because I'm so full of fiber and nutrients, right? And and we know that if we eat really nutrient dense foods, the body doesn't like clamor for much more. No, it's cool, yeah. But unlike you know when I've eaten bags and bags of popcorn, um, and <laughs> hey, eaten bowls and bowls of rice because there isn't too much nutrition in it. So I did this test uh, the other day. I played classical music for my Pandora. Station mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. while prepping this breakfast salad, mm -hmm. and I and ah this mm -hmm. piano guy's station like that not almost <laughs> even slower than that, <laughs> and I found myself preparing it so slowly and beautifully. Yeah, it affects and what you do. Though. Yeah, mm. I felt really nice, and I sat at my window and ate it, and I found myself chewing to it, and I said, "Yeah, this is like every restaurant that had beautiful music playing, mm. where I felt like, oh yeah, I'll just order the next thing, and the next thing. This is such a nice mm -hmm. environment." Mm -hmm. So today I did something different. I played instead the instead of the piano guys station. I played. I forget exactly what the station was called, but it started with Rammstein, which is some kind of like, you know, death metal kind of heavy okay. kind of stuff. And I said, let me prepare <laughs> let's see, let's see what comes this out with this, huh? salad to this kind of music. <laughs> and, and just hearing the first few bars of it, I was not wanting to eat immediately. Right. Um, right. Strangely, right. I was cutting the food and I felt like everything seemed salty. I mm. didn't taste it yet. Yeah. And I just felt like this isn't going to be right. Wow, that's and really fascinating. Here's a thought that was so interesting as I was preparing. I felt like the knife was sharper. But it wasn't. I didn't sharpen it. But I felt like to this death metal music that... So it adjusted your perceptions on, on every level, every sense. Exactly. Yeah. It's very interesting because just this morning I was having I couldn't a eat it, by the way. Like it took me an hour and a half to eat breakfast. <laughs> yeah, well, because... <laughs> Uh, I was just having a conversation this um, this morning with my girlfriend and Annie. If you're listening, shout out, yo. <laughs> um, 
And she was reading an article in the New Yorker about um, about the use of music in what they call psyops, psychological operations, like military, military, hmm. uh, not just military, also commercial. There's a company named Muzak that made huh. good jolt loads of money. That's a new word. It's a lot good of loads. Uh, good jolt good loads. Load. Like gajillions of boatloads <laughs> of money. Um, making an environment that makes you browse around more and buy more stuff. Sure. By, by removing certain elements of the music that produce the kinds of responses that you're talking about with your death metal salad. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, and then, then you have, then you have, um, uh, this article mentioned, uh, seven eleven owners that would, that would pipe classical music and easy listening into the parking lots sure. to get rid of the kids that are hanging out there. <laughs> In other words, it has the opposite <laughs> effect. They want, they're hanging out and they're loitering. He doesn't want them there anyway, so he puts on like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, the and then they, they're out of there. <laughs> no, you know, it's so interesting that you say that because years ago I went into the new at the time Sony store. Yeah. And there were these little boom boxes on display. And this is a true story. Someone's probably going to come after me for saying this because this is definitely like a secret tactic. Mm -hmm. I opened the boom boxes and they were kind of glued or taped shut. But I was like, why is this one like glued shut? And I forced it open. Inside the CD player was a corporate disc that says, if you play music, they will buy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I stood there, and I didn't have a digital camera at the time because that's how long ago it was. It's like, oh, I'm going to curse for a sec. Motherfuckers. <laughs> it's like, they're tricking us with music. Yeah. But, you know, it's like you're saying music has such a, a you know, it has a grasp. It, it yeah. grips us. Yeah. Well, well, part of this article was talking about, about um, in Iraq, they would, they would use music to torture prisoners. They would give them rap, death metal, and children's songs <laughs> at the highest possible volume That's with strobe horrible. lights. Yeah, and it would induce like, like I mean, it would drive them literally crazy. No, but that's very interesting because I kind of like that environment. So mm -hmm. that wouldn't be torture to me. <laughs> I'm like, uh, and I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. You know, that, though, like, you know? <laughs> children's music. I mean, it's wow. funny. Like, even it depends on the situation. The connotation can change on a dime. You know, Could you anything. eat food uh, to children's music? Or do you think that would just irritate you and you couldn't eat? Like what kind of what kind of music it, can it you would, eat to? I, I hate to say this, being a teacher of child, a music teacher of children, but <laughs> it would really irritate me. <laughs> so if right now I'm eating a plate of pasta, what yeah. music do you recommend goes with my pasta? You know, um, I think that it's it really it's what you like because. Uh, you know, it's like what goes on your pasta, you know, I mean, and it's what you feel like in the moment. Uh, part of this article was also talking about that, you know, music therapy um, is effective. You know, you don't use the same song for everybody. You know, mm. if, if a person is into heavy metal, you know, you're, you're not going to play the Captain and Tennille, you know, mm -hmm. for, for, for their therapy. It's not going to work. They need the music that they identify with. And and I think that the same is true that if you're if you're creating your your overall sort of gestalt experience around your your meal, mm -hmm. and you're listening to and or, you know, alternating going to the piano and burning your food like <laughs> I am, um, uh, that that you that you do what's in your head and what you what you want to engage with at any given moment. And if you have eclectic tastes, you know, maybe maybe that. Maybe that death metal is, is, is effective for that salad, given your mood that day. And you're like, man, I just need to just... I need to murder, darn you, I need to murder uh, this salad. <laughs> right. Oh, that felt good. You know, I mean, it, it depends on the moment. It depends on the person. And you're right, because, you know, in creating that particular mood, like, let's say, for example, at, at 8 o'clock, I'm DJing at The Roost mm -hmm. on Avenue B, which you know where it is. Mm -hmm. 222 Avenue B, I'm DJing a set of Brooklyn hip hop. Uh, sorry. Bronx, Bronx hip hop, hip -hop yeah. for Bronx Brewery. Yeah. So we're creating that mood that'll get people in the right mindset to be loving what they're drinking, create that family kind of feeling and buying more beer. 
See? Yeah. If you play beer music, they'll buy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you always see how, and we don't even, it's so ubiquitous, we don't even talk about it anymore. And in fact, you know, people look at music as like it's just this extra thing that we don't, that we don't yeah, need. Yeah, it's and yet, not. And yet, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, yeah. It's everywhere. You go to a baseball game here. Yeah. And I do that when I'm practicing my scales. <laughs> It's part of our, our life soundtrack experience. It's everything. everywhere, and it's so ubiquitous, you don't even notice it's there. There are some restaurants that I've been to that have actually, and, you know, Starbucks has a music sector to it. They yeah. put their music out in the they're front. They're like a whole label. Yeah, and uh, there are restaurants I've been that I can't name. There's so many that have been mostly on the West Coast, where on the table I'd see a track list of what they're playing, mm-hmm. because they're, pay- they're, yeah. they're pairing the music well, with the food as well. They're super smart. The, which is how they became like I think the like the the largest company in the universe uh, because they they know how to sell stuff and 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 they and they they realized what was going on in the record business with this whole Napster revolution and the streaming and the loss of uh, and the, and the, the the end of physical media CDs you know it's pe- people our age do CDs kids nowadays they don't know CD what is this thing what is this round I what is a know, shiny so thing I can, if I could put my <laughs> drink on it I can you know uh, and, and and they realize well wait a minute okay so who's our audience okay and they're the ones that are going to actually buy CDs and you know what they're more likely to buy a CD if they heard it okay mm-hmm. and then and, uh, and so and look we have a cafe let's let's put it on and by the way you like that you it's right here next to oh, yeah why don't you buy it next to the mandolin there's man, mandolin. <laughs> There's a mandolin, <laughs> and then a man with a violin. And <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but you make a good point. That they, you know, they, the they know how to sell it. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's actually kind of part of this new model um, of of distributing music. You know, which nobody knows what it's going to be. Yet. I mean, music. It's it, the whole music business is like. What's happening to us? I have no idea. We're melting. I do know. We'll take a little break and we'll come back. We're going to talk more about improvising. Yeah. Music and cooking. I and the that. elements that go into music and see how, how similar it is to preparing food. Awesome. Hey, this is Gavin Van Vlack from Physical Culture Collective, Bushwick, Brooklyn. You are listening to the Heritage Radio Network. Gavin Van Vlack and Jenny Livingston at Physical Culture Collective bring you an alternative gym experience right in Bushwick. It's fun to move around and to move around in a way that you wouldn't normally get a chance to do. So like a lot of what we do here is... um, you know, on the ground or standing, you're not, you know, you're using equipment, but you're not using machines. I grew up in very alternative cultures. I grew up in the punk rock and hardcore scene. Muay Thai was something that very much resonated to me. And it was like, yeah, this is, this is something that I can get around. This is, this is a sport that's for me. Learn more about classes and membership options at physicalculturecollective.com or visit them at 857 Broadway in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we're back with Isaac Raz, and we're talking about music. I think you might have a song you want to play for us. Well, I guess I do. Um, this is just a, um, a pretty little love song, and it's called Then You Walked In. Oh. Nothing was wrong. Nothing was right. Halfway in darkness, halfway in light, same old routine, caught in between, then the door opens and I'm waiting for my heart to 
Good digesting music for Cynthia. <laughs> that was beautiful. So that's a piece that you wrote. Yeah. It's an I, original I, piece. I wrote it with, uh, with a collaborator of mine, Juliet Green, who lives out in California. That and is we really were, beautiful. Yeah. What, what are the you. ingredients that go into making music? Um, what are the ingredients that go into making music? The elements. The- well, um, Arlo Guthrie came and gave a talk to a bunch of Berkeley students, one of which was me. And and he said, you know, writing a song's not so much you wrote it, but one flew by and you had a pen handy. <laughs> so there's that element. The fact that it was always there. My teacher likes to say that, you know, electricity was there before we discovered it. Hmm. We just found ways of getting to it. And so writing a piece of music is a little bit like that. It just is there. Um, and you, you're, you're trying to find a w- your way to it. Um, and and what, how do you find your way to it? Well, you have tools. You have technique. You have the instrument or instruments that you play. Um, you have your life experience and um, your memories and your emotions. Um, you have your, your uh, intellectual, conceptual knowledge of the musical language, of the language... The, the verbal language in which you're writing. Um, so I'd say those would be the basic elements. And then there's that, uh, you know, since we're on the radio, I have to give a nod to Peter Shickley, who used to close his show by saying, it, it don't mean a thing unless it has that certain je ne sais quoi. I guess that would be the other element. <laughs> <laughs> The undefined, the <laughs> indefinable thing. <laughs> I mean, for me, obviously, you know, and I say it to everyone, music is nourishing for me. Yes. Um, it's energizing. And we all have been to that, you know, have had that evening or that night at a club and we haven't eaten, but somehow we're full of energy. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, pumping our fists or dancing or whatever you do. And somehow nourished. Well, it creates a state of flow that that mm-hmm. really um, X's out everything else. Um, you know, uh, I can't tell you how many times, like, I, I get into something and I don't know how much time has passed or I don't even realize somebody's trying to get my attention. I'm so into like it. Hours can go. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. If, whether sure. it's hours or minutes, the, where your immersion in that moment. And of course, that's the goal. That's what you're right. trying to get to is is to is to attain that perfection of being in the moment. And uh, uh, my teacher does that. Like you could be like, "Hey," and he and he's figuring something out. And it, it, there's nothing else. That he could be exactly, sitting on a burning log and oh, not know it. I am exactly like that when I'm prepping food. Yeah. When I'm quote you're, improvising in with a my focus. food, yeah. I am so focused because you're planning what you're gonna, what's coming up ahead, yeah. and how long is it? Okay, so while that's getting ready, I can do this, and then and then you do that. Okay, so now I got that started. What's my next thing? Okay, I guess I'll clean up a little, and then you're constantly planning ahead while you're in the moment, and you're trying not to cut yourself, you're trying not to burn yourself. <laughs> and you know, and you make me raise this question, like, okay, so I could really be focused as I'm preparing the food. However, I'll rush through eating it, but I don't rush through listening to music. 
Oh wow, restaurant eating it. Yeah. I, I, I was watching a cooking show. Though. I think it was an Italian food, and and they were saying, you know, cook fast, eat slow. I need to do a that, little bit more eat th- slow. That would totally stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Me too. I'm, we need I some vacuum. more eat slow. Music. My dad used to tell me I vacuum my food. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'll take. I'll spend a lot of time prepping, and I need to. Uh, I need more Isaac music in the background while I'm eating it. That's right. <laughs> slow as you go. This is slow eating music. It's actually the same song. I need another song. <laughs> now, creativity is an important form of primary food for myself and you and so many people. I mean. You can agree. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How do you teach your students? And what ages are your students? My students are literally from 5 to 55. Oh, they're, <laughs> they're young. Some of them are young. Some of them are extremely young, and it's, and it's their first experience. Um, they come to the piano, and, and they'll have a they'll experiment, and maybe some of these up here, and maybe some of these down here. And they'll start to put things together, like in cooking. I wonder if this goes with that. Now we try some of the black ones. Okay, Do you explain to them this like idea of like what a simple carb music would be and a complex carb <laughs> piece of music would be? Well, a five-year-old might have difficulty with that, but but I, I you know what? I'm actually sitting there watching them trying to learn myself, uh, trying to learn because because you know you spend your life really trying to develop your technique at something. And the more you do that, paradoxically, you lose the initial innocent spark that you had when you first started and you didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so you're constantly with this trying to balance those two seemingly opposing forces, right? And so when I when I have a first timer, little five year old that gets to the piano the first time and I show them. I might show them where C is, all right, or I might show, or or I just say, I oh, just you know try some of these. Okay, now put all your fingers on it. You know, you start just little basic physical things instead of just doing one finger. But well, try all five fingers. Okay, Let's see what that. And then you see how they. Oh, oh, what do these ones do over here? Oh, and then it the element of play comes in. They call it playing music, right? Um, I would imagine that that when you're when you're if. if if you're a foodie and you want to come up with your own recipe or your own take another recipe, it's that same form of play. It's like, hmm, sure. I wonder, I wonder, yeah, what if I did put, you know, tamarind in this, you know, or whatever, you know. But what's your thought on, you know, since everything seems so subjective also, you mm-hmm. know, like everyone has their own taste mm-hmm. like when it comes to music and when it comes to food. Like, how do you, how do you come across something or how do you create something that can be generally liked? What are, what are the... What's the constant or the common thread there? Wow, that's a that's a great. Wouldn't we all like to create something that would be generally yeah, like? Yeah, what's, what's the pop music? If of I food, had a dollar, aside from French fries, if I had a dollar for everybody liking something that I create, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I guess I guess there there's a whole there's an art in knowing your audience, and um, one uh, I heard somebody once say uh, this was. Uh, talking about marketing and and he, and he said my biggest marketing mistake was i gave them what they needed instead of what they wanted hmm. and and you you have to you have to sort of meet people halfway you know you you could you could be like you know hey isn't this great it's real sophisticated no trust me it's beautiful <laughs> And then people will be like, "Okay, thank That's you like very much." That's like every meal that was shoved in my face. And then, and then there's, and then there's, you know, and then there's something in between, you know, and it's finding exactly the balance between those two extremes, and it's going to be different for everybody. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna try to reach a a, a big audience. You have to. It's it's almost impossible. How everybody has different different tastes, but that's your job. You got to find that. You said the word I was going to bring up: taste. That you know, between music and food, it's so much also about taste. Yeah. You know, and I don't mean just the taste and preference. I mean like the actual taste, like how my ears, you know, receive what you're playing, how my taste buds receive what you're putting yeah. in my face. It's it's the, it's really an awesome comparison between the two, uh, and 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 it does nourish us. It does nourish us. Uh, and they go hand in hand. They really do. 
Where can people find out more about the work you do in music, websites and so on? Well, um, you can go to my my company's website, which is Whole Music LLC. Whole, like whole wheat. Whole music, the whole experience. The experience involving the person, the whole person. Um, and uh, you can find out all about me there, wholemusicllc.com. And you focus on whole as in, in the holistic sense. And why is that? Well, because nothing music doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, it's, to me, a, 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 lot of, a lot of times I see music being taught sort of top down. You know, this is what you have to do. And, you know, you must practice and you must this and you must that. And, and there's an element of truth to that. But if you, if you really focus on that method, you're going to end up just being able to do this. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to quit. <laughs> because it, it's, it really doesn't hit you where you need it and and part of what i try to do in my approach is i try to really see who my audience is and I, and what their goals are what they like and then i sneak in what they need because you know you don't want to reinvent the wheel there's a certain way to teach things but again it's like i hear i just hear the similarities between constructing music and an audience for an audience and constructing food for people to eat yeah it's, it's very cool. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. And one more time, your website before we close? WholeMusicLLC.com. This is Isaac Raz. And this is Cynthia Cherish Mallorin. You've been listening to Primary Food. Please come back for more. For listening to this program on heritageradionetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes Store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritage radio network.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. <laughs>